Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Near Eastern Origin Stories. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to look at several different cultures of the ancient Near East and figure out how they thought the origins of their world and people came to be. So, we're going to start in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. From there, we'll look at biblical origin stories. That's right, origin stories, plural. And then we'll close with some Egyptian origin stories and wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So, let's go ahead and start in Mesopotamia. So when we say the word Mesopotamia, what we're talking about is the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So here in the southern part we have the Euphrates, just to the north of that we have the Tigris. And then in ancient Greece, they named this land Mesopotamia, which literally translates as the middle, meso, of the rivers, Potamia. So, Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates. Now, this was the homeland of these kind of Near Eastern uh, civilizations that arose during the Bronze Age. Now, when we look at their origin stories, what you have to remember is there are many different kind of variations of this. And for us, they're all fragmentary. We get them from little cuneiform tablets that look like this. So I'm going to tell one cohesive narrative, but realize that this is kind of a compilation of a lot of different uh, stories that each kind of have their own twist. And just down here, kind of what you're looking at, uh, the names of those stories, the most prominent ones are the Eridu Genesis, the Atrahasis, and the Enuma Elish. So in the Mesopotamian origin story, it all starts with Namu, the primeval sea, right? So this is the entity from which all things arose. And out of that sea, Namu gave birth to Anki, right? And you can think of Anki as the universe. It's kind of like a mound of soil and sky, like earth and sky kind of all mixed together. So it's hard to get a picture of earth and sky all mixed together. So I went with something awesome, the pillars of creation. Now, Anki ends up giving birth to Enlil. And Enlil is the god of air, all right? And later on, Enlil is going to become one of the major Mesopotamian gods. And one of the first things Enlil does is he, he separates An, the sky, right? Think of Father Sky, from Ki. Think of Mother Earth. So now all of a sudden there's a clear division between Earth and Sky. And you can kind of see the parallel in something like the biblical origin story as well, where we get that separation of earth and sky, the firmament, firmament and the waters, and the waters and the land. Now, Enlil mates with Ki, and together they produce Enki. And this literally translates as Lord of Water and Earth, right? It literally translates as like Lord of the Earth. And he's also a god of water, and you can see the water flowing through him right here. This is Enki, and you can see the, the fish uh, they're kind of flowing towards him or away from him or, I don't know, it's a cylinder seal. It's tough to read. So, now that we've got the earth and the sky and we've got the lord of the earth, uh, it's been populated with animals, plants and animals all over the place. And it was the gods' job to take care of them, kind of the minor gods. It was their role to take care of all these animals. Now, eventually they realized, huh, this is a lot of work. And so that's why they created humans, right? So according to one of the stories, the reason humans were created was to basically take care of the earth, take care of the plants, and take care of the animals. And the gods do this by all spitting into a single place. And then it turns into this kind of womb thing. And 10 months later, outbursts the first people. Now, a problem arises. And according to which story you read, right, it's a different problem each time. It could be that people are weak and lazy, right? They're just not very good at doing things. Or it could be that people are really kind of successful and they're overpopulating the world, right? So that's one of the major kind of uh, sects of the story. Uh, or it could be that people are just kind of wicked and evil, and that may sound familiar from the biblical story. But either way, the gods need to get rid of the people. And they do so by sending a giant flood. Now, this is one of the things that's common. No matter which of the stories that you look at from the ancient Near Eastern world, you get a story of a massive flood used to wipe out mankind. Except for, of course, the chosen survivor. Now, you, of course, have heard of Noah, but in, according to the kind of different things, there, there's um, a number of different people or names as to that one person who survives the flood. All right? So, 
God sends the flood to wipe everybody else, uh, wipe out everybody else out of the picture, and then one guy uh, and his wife survive. And after the flood subsides, we're left with this kind of one couple, and they start to take care of the earth and repopulate the world. And according to one of the Near Eastern stories, this happens. They're left on the banks, essentially, of the Tigris and Euphrates. They start farming there, and then we get the civilizations of the ancient Near East. So let's go ahead and move over to talk about biblical origin stories. And you're probably already thinking that what we just talked about with the Near Eastern one is kind of sounds familiar, right? The names are different, uh, the places might be a little bit different, but in general, that kind of progression sounds kind of familiar with the, the creation of things and the splitting of different areas. So when we talk about the land of the Bible, what we're looking at is the kind of southern half of the Levant, right? So what's kind of labeled as Canaan right here. And in terms of our sources, what we're looking at are books one and two of Genesis, right? Of the Old Testament of the Bible, what's also known as the Torah. So, uh, in general, Genesis is traditionally attributed to Moses. Now, most scholars don't think that it was one person who actually wrote this, and we'll see why in just a second. Most scholars think that Genesis itself was written sometime in the 7th or 6th century BC, so the 600s or 500s BC. Now let's go through each of the days. Before the days ever get started, it says in the beginning, right, God created the heavens and the earth. So God was there from the beginning, and we don't really get an explanation of where God came from. He's just always been around. But on day one, he says, let there be light. And the first thing God does is he separates the darkness from the light, and day and night are created. Now on day two, what we get is we get the creation of the firmament. So basically the waters, the kind of primeval waters, are separated from heaven. All right? Uh, so this is different from the, uh, the heavens that were originally there. Um, this is kind of the actual heaven. Now, uh, day three we get the creation of land. So, so far we've had the waters and we've had the firmament. Now, finally, we have land. And at this point in time, God also creates the plants. Day four, he creates basically the atmosphere. So the, the sun and the stars, right? Uh, the moon, the greater light and the lesser light. And so now we've got, we've got plants, we've got land, we've got water, we've got the firmament, and we've got the moon and stars and sun. And at this point in time, we start getting this ruling language introduced as well. So all of a sudden, right, the heavens kind of have control over these different entities. Day five, we got sea creatures. So on day five, the sea is populated with all sorts of different animals. And you can see some parallels here with ancient Mesopotamian myths, where one of the major kind of conflicts in the origin story is kind of a battle between gods and then like sea serpents or sea monsters of some kind of sort. And then finally on day six, we get God creating the animals on earth here, and then eventually people, man and woman, were created together on day six. And man, you gotta be exhausted after that. So on day seven, God takes a break. And later on, right in the second book of the Torah, right, uh, Exodus, we see that this seventh day becomes holy, and man is commanded to work on days one through six, but take that seventh day and use it to worship God. Now, one of the interesting things about the, the kind of origin story or the genesis of, uh, of the biblical, um, of the kind of the biblical text is that we've got actually two different versions here. So we just went through the creation of, uh, of, of the earth and uh, of people in Genesis book one, but we get a parallel story actually in, uh, in book two, all right? Um, and so what we end up seeing in Genesis uh, chapter two is we see God creates the heavens and earth at first. Okay, that's the same so far. And then plant life appears. All right, that's like more or less in the same order. But then we get man created. And I say man on purpose here because it's just men who are created. And then after men are created, then we get animals. And then a little bit later on, we see man being kind of bored, right? And so to keep him company, God creates woman. And she does so by taking the rib from Adam right here, right? And pulling woman out. And now there are men and women. 
And we can see that this is a little bit different, where animals come first here, and then, uh, then um, God creates people at the same time after that. Here it's man, then animals, then woman. So, uh, we get kind of these uh, two different stories, and what this suggests to us is that the, the kind of Old Testament of the Bible, especially the origin stories, are a combination of different stories that were out there at the time that have kind of been woven together into a coherent narrative, but there are still these kind of weak joins. So, again, just like we see in the Mesopotamian origin stories, God is not happy with the people, in this case, because they've started being wicked. And so in this one, right, he chooses Noah as the person to save. And Noah and his wife, they get all the animals together onto the ark. And it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And it floods the world. And eventually the flood waters subside. And uh, Noah is able to procreate, repopulating the earth. And the animals do the same. So let's move south and west to the land of Egypt. So ancient Egypt, the gift of the Nile, so we're in the Nile River Delta over here. And uh, what we've got here is we've got several different origin stories. Just like the Mesopotamian myths, right? A lot of these times are taken from uh, inscriptions on walls or papyrus texts like we have here. And we actually have fuller stories here. Uh, but different regions have different stories. But there are some things that are common to both, or common to all of them, all right? And just like with the Mesopotamian myths, one of the common things is that we start with the primeval waters. And in this case, they call those waters Nu, all right? So it's Namu in the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian myths, it's Nu in the Egyptian myths. And these are the, the, this is the kind of entity from which all things arose. Now slowly, those waters kind of subside. And out of the waters arises this kind of pyramid-shaped pyramid mound, right? This is the primordial mound. In Egyptian, they call this the Benben, right? It's fun to say. Think of this as the Benben, all right? Um, and so this is what happens when the Nile floods kind of recede, right, after the flooding season, and then you get land appearing once again. So the first god to arise from the primordial mound was the god Ra, the god of the sun. And so most of the myths, he's the one who comes up. And what you're looking at here is this is a representation of the Benben, the primordial mound. And you see the sun rising up kind of uh, in the middle of it. And that's what it looks like, even a pyramidal shaped thing. If you have the sun come up behind it, right, it kind of ends up looking like two pillars here. Now we get this idea of the Benben recreated in Egyptian architecture all over the place. So what you're looking at here is literally called the Benben stone. And on the top of pyramids in ancient Egypt, you have, would have one stone that was kind of the final piece, the single stone at the very, very top. And they called this either the Pyramidion or the Benben stone. And this was once again meant to represent that primordial mound. And when you think about it, pyramids in general are all representing this primordial mound, right? The shape of the thing uh, to begin with is representing that land that arose when the, the floodwaters of the Nile subsided. And these pyramids themselves are actually built step by step, um, or at least they originally were, from these things called mastaba tombs. And you can see these like uh, kind of auxiliary pyramids down here and how they're built in kind of phases. If you just look at the bottommost phase, that's the original tomb style of royalty in ancient Egypt, and that's called the mastaba. And that was representative of the primordial mound. And then the way we got pyramids is that eventually uh, King Djoser ends up deciding to stack one on top of the other on top of the other, and then eventually Snefru uh, ends up flattening out the sides, and that's where we get our pyramidal structure, but all representing the primordial mound. As do the entrance gates to, to Egyptian temples. So this is known as a pylon, all right? And you're gonna see this in a lot of different Egyptian temples, and once again, they align this so that the sun rises right between the kind of two different uh, pillars here. And again, this looks like the sun, the, the sun god Ra, arising from the middle of the, uh, the primordial mound. So all these different things in Egyptian architecture go back to this idea of the primordial mound arising from the Nile uh, floods and then the gods arising from there. Now, there are a couple different regional stories where things break off from here, and we're going to touch on four really briefly. 
So the first one is from the site of Heliopolis. And in this story, we've got Atum as kind of the original god. And so Atum himself has kind of like, he's both man and woman. He's kind of got all the parts. And the way that he kind of procreates from this primordial mound ends up being the, like this idea that he, he basically masturbates. And, uh, and then spewing his seed, we get the other gods arising. And so we've got Shu and we've got Tefnut, all right? And so those are the, uh, the next kind of two. And you can think of these as, uh, as kind of the, the waters in the sky, all right? Uh, and then they give birth, and they give birth to Geb, who's uh, Mother Earth, and Newt, who's like kind of the, the father sky figure, right? Um, so this is kind of air and water, and then we get earth and sky. And then Geb and Newt get together, and they basically give birth to the Egyptian pantheon, right? These are the guys that are the gods of the actual Egyptian people. These are kind of the forerunners. So Isis and Osiris, Nephthys and Set, these are the gods that people in ancient Egypt actually would have worshipped. Now, uh, elsewhere in Egypt, we have uh, the site of Hermopolis. And in Hermopolis, the, the story rises out of the Ogdoad, right? So that's kind of a fun name to say, the Ogdoad. And what this basically means is the eight gods. And the idea is that in the primordial waters, there are eight gods. Again, kind of before the time of Osiris and, um, and um, Osiris and Amun and all these other gods that are actually worshipped in Egypt, there are these kind of eight primordial gods, and they're swimming around in the waters. And the men are kind of personified, well, I guess not personified, uh, animalized as frogs, all right? And the women are kind of animalized as snakes. And eventually they get into this kind of tussle together, and it's this collision of all of these animals and gods, right, that, that starts the process of the primordial mound erupting. And then it goes on from there. Now in Memphis, all right, in Lower Egypt, up near the Nile Delta, uh, we get the god Ptah creating everything. But this is a very different type of creation. Here he's creating uh, with ideas. He's thinking things into being. And so what we see is kind of an intellectual creation. And oftentimes we'll see this um, combined with like the myth of uh, Heliopolis to give a, a fuller picture of what creation was like. Uh, Ptah combining the kind of like... Um, intellectual creation with the actual physical creation of Heliopolis. And then finally, at Thebes, down in Lower Egypt, down in the south, we get Amun being the key god at the creation. So he's part of the Agdo Agdoad, right, the part of those eight gods. But down in Thebes, they see him as kind of more powerful than the other seven combined. He came before them, he gave rise to them. And so even though he's one of them, he's more powerful than all. And we see the power of Amun spread as Thebes gets more and more powerful, especially in the New Kingdom. Amun becomes one of the kind of key gods in the ancient Egyptian pantheon. So let's wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So the, the kind of conclusion to this story is that it's one of similarity and of difference. It's kind of amazing that you can go all over the ancient Near East and all over the biblical lands. And in many cases, the kind of um, uh, the movement from uh, the progression, right? That's the word I'm looking for. The progression uh, from kind of the nothingness, the chaos, right? Towards earth and land and sky and these kind of divisions and then plants and animals and people. It's very, very similar across this space. And yet in all of these cultures, we see that there are kind of different mini variations, and so we see that in Mesopotamia with kind of reasons why people need to be wiped out, whether it's because they're weak or because they're overpopulated or because they're just not very good people. And we see that in Genesis with kind of the order of things switching between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And we see that in Egypt with the, uh, the story from Heliopolis and Hermopolis and Memphis and Thebes. And so there are all these kind of similarities across them, and yet each of those have their own differences. And uh, so that's more or less kind of the story of the ancient Near Eastern origin stories. <laughs>